With the permission of Chair, uh, sir, uh, should we start calling the first speaker? Uh, our first speaker for our today's session, the first session is on uh, lifestyle medicine. And uh, our first speaker is Dr. Shagufta Feroz. She is Pakistan's first physician who is running a drugless family medicine clinic uh, for the last 17 years on based on the principle of life, uh, lifestyle medicine, integrative medicine and our in-depth independent research called Synchronized Lifestyle Modification Program, SLP, uh, is uh, one of the prominent work that she has done. She has done two PhDs from USA in the holistic nutrition and integrative uh, medicine. Uh, Dr. Shagufta Feroz uh, will present on uh, lifestyle uh, medicine foundation of medical sciences. Dr. Shagufta, over to you. I am going to talk on a very, very important topic, which is uh, that lifestyle medicine is the foundation of medical sciences. And yes, it is the foundation of medical sciences. I hope I am able to, to, to give you enough knowledge till the end of my session that you, you are convinced, yes, that we all need to know about lifestyle medicine as a, as a speciality. So my, the learning objectives are to know the basics of lifestyle medicine and what, what are the six pillars of lifestyle medicine and how it plays an important role in the prevention of non-communicable diseases, which is majorly the theme of this conference, and how we can modify one pillar, which is nutrition, and how we can eat correctly to enhance our immunity so that we can protect ourselves from these upcoming uh, chronic diseases. So it is the use of evidence-based lifestyle therapeutic approaches such as whole food, plant, predominant foods, then regular physical activity, adequate sleep, stress management, and avoidance of risky substances and better social connections to prevent, treat, and reverse a chronic disease. 
It is validated as highly effective uh, therapy. It addresses the root cause of all diseases with better out outcomes and lower cost. It is value-based, engaging, affordable, and patient-centered. So these are the characteristics. What are the unique features of this lifestyle medicine, which is definitely uh, a conventional medicine speciality? It is based on behavioral change theories, or you can say that it is based on behavioral sciences. The beauty is it focuses on physicians' self-care before focusing on the health of their patients. It trains a doctor to play a role of a coach by becoming compassionate and empathetic. Very unique science. We as doctors never, never learned this. It teaches how to address childhood traumas, which is ACE, and, and its connection to adult age onset of non-communicable diseases. So we as lifestyle medicine experts are supposed to uh, take the his past history and especially the childhood history, because that history will be connecting to the some chronic disorder, some cardiac disease, some rheumatoid arthritis at age 40. So the root cause will go in the childhood. So what are the theories? You can see the list of all those theories. And this, this element was missing in our science, in our practice. So you just have an idea what are the theories which, uh, which support lifestyle medicine and how the curriculum was developed. So it was not so easy to be, to be established as a speciality in America. So these were the, the bodies and the representatives from all these organizations. You can, you can see the list of, and they are called the Blue Ribbon Panel on Physician Lifestyle Medicine Competencies. So in order to get certified into lifestyle medicine, they have to go through the syllabus designed by the experts from these, uh, these sciences, these various specialities. Just a brief history of lifestyle medicine. This was founded in 2004 by Dr. John Kelly. Currently it has about 8,000 members. And the, again, the very unique feature of this uh, movement is that 27 international societies from all over the world are part of this movement. And WHO is also now uh, inco incorporating the role of lifestyle medicine in preventive of NCDs. Then they have started American Board of Lifestyle Medicine and in order to accommodate international doctors, they have started International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. And Pakistan is, is very blessed to have their first International Board of Lifestyle Medicine in December. Then you can see that lifestyle medicine is taught at undergrad level and postgrad level in Loma Linda University, Harvard, and University of South Carolina. Besides many medical schools, they are teaching it at undergrad level. So in order to prevent or reverse non-communicable disease behavior, change is uh, behavior change is mandatory. Behavior change is mandatory. So you can see how uh, behaviors are attached to disease. Tobacco use, physical activity or physical inactivity and incorrect diet lead to so many diseases. And by modifying these behaviors, you can correct the other factors also. So this is a, just a summary of uh, uh, huge studies. Interheart study, uh, where the 52 countries were involved and they have found five uh, factors, which are actually the lifestyle factors, smoking, dyslipidemias, hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. Diabetes and obesity, it's, they themselves are lifestyle diseases. So, uh, so we can avoid cardiac diseases by avoiding those risk factors. Then lifestyle changes can increase telomerase, the enzyme that lengthens telomere. So that means it plays a good role in longevity. You can see adherence to four healthy behaviors can prevent 93% of diabetes, 81% of heart attacks, 50% of strokes, 36% of all cancers. Then we know that we all talk about lifestyle medicine, every speciality, they talk about lifestyle medicine. We, were, we are not uh, educated enough to talk about lifestyle medicine. In metabolic syndromes, there is role of lifestyle medicine. 
then this you can see american heart association talks about uh, adherence to healthy lifestyle but what is healthy lifestyle we are not fully aware so now the the triangle has got lifestyle medicine at its base so you can say how important the the inclusion of lifestyle medicine is becoming in disease management so again the six pillars of lifestyle medicine are predominantly plant based food with dietary discipline physical activity sleep stress management on the principles of positive psychology which is uh, introduction of happiness instead of fighting depression instead of introducing antidepressants it teaches us to to make a person happy then avoidance of substance abuse and social connection social connection is a very very important pillar of lifestyle medicine so how it reverses what is its mode of disease reversal it targets dysbiosis and we all are familiar with dysbiosis it targets inflammation and we know inflammation is the root cause of all chronic disorders oxidative damage we we learn a lot about free radicals antioxidants but we don't know how to counter this oxidative damage then lipotoxicity all of us are familiar that all the patients coming with ultrasound most of the patient i i have to be careful in my statement they do carry an ultrasound with fatty liver and we can't do anything to reverse that fatty liver so fat this is what is lipotoxicity so once a person modifies the lifestyle fatty liver also reverses so how it plays its role in immunity so you know there are two types of immunity innate immunity and adaptive immunity innate is we are born with and adaptive immunity is connected to our lifestyle behaviors we all are familiar with the sites of our immune system but the major site is gut so 70% of our immunity resides in our gut and which is called the microbiota and interestingly the gut microbiome is now called the forgotten organ and you can see in the in the lower uh, uh, box that 70% of immune system is in the gut and if the gut microbiome is not healthy we call it dysbiosis so you have seen in the previous slide that it targets dysbiosis to heal or to reverse a chronic disorder and you can see in this uh, this image also that how unhealthy microbiome can lead to so many disorders you can just go through the list which include metabolic syndrome cardiovascular all autonomic disorders gut related disorders systemic inflammations they are an outcome of dysbiosis because 70% of the immunity is in the gut so so it proves that number one killer factor for microbiome is unhealthy food just a news to share we are very fond of fast foods even the doctors we very uh, easily consume biscuits in our tea breaks so you just go through what these junk foods contain and the lethal component is trans fats and trans fats that are present in the junk foods is responsible for atherosclerosis and heart disease cancers you can see the whole list of chronic disorders uh, i would say congenital disorders i would say many genetic disorders the cause lies in the food consumed by an adult or by a young girl who is going to be a mother so how can we enhance gut immunity simply follow certain rules follow correct meal timings i don't have the time to go into the details be careful take your breakfast before 9 am consume your lunch before 9 pm especially for doctors coming late from the clinics they are having dinner at 11 or 12 consume few natural foods uh, combinations of food are important never take desserts after the food have all types of meetas before the food don't adhere to one type of food we are in a habit of having toast and egg every day no you need to rotate food just to avoid the shift in the ph 
When there is a shift in the pH, there is oxidative damage. Then food temperature is important. Then quantity of food, food preference is important. We even don't know how to drink water correctly. We have done studies and we were surprised to learn that even educated people don't know how to drink water correctly. So these are the eight basic rules which connect to dysbiosis. And we all probably are uh, following those unhealthy principles of eating. So you know that good habits are also addictive like unhealthy habits. And I would like to finish by saying that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used be when we created them. So if we want something healthy in our routine, we have to change our approach toward that problem. So these are the various references. And thank you very much. You can have more information on the giving links. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shagufta. And uh, it's very elaborative and well-structured presentation. Uh, I'll call our next speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Shahzad Ali Khan. Uh, Professor Dr. Shahzad Ali Khan uh, is currently working as a Vice Chancellor at uh, Health Services Academy. Uh, Dr. Shahzad Ali Khan has uh, uh, done his uh, uh, graduation from King Edward Medical College and uh, uh, he has several years of experience in serving in, in uh, health sector and he also did his master in business administration with major in finance, MS from in, in public health from Qaeda Azam University, Islamabad. And uh, he's among the very few people who has done PhD in the management sciences in Pakistan as well. Uh, I guess if I continue speaking, I'll take lots of time uh, after the session. I'll call upon Dr. Uh, Professor Shahzad Ali Khan. Thank you, Munawar, for the kind introduction. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Um, with the permission of Chair, I am a bilingual. I am to say that I am going to say that I am going to say that I am It was very, really, really heartening to see Shagufta and the lifestyle medication and all other. Uh, preventive approaches which are rare in Pakistan. I am in a medical college, mein hu, International Islamic and Rifa University, we have a lot of public health and other things. So, the medical college we teach us, when we go to life, actually, they are a senior, so we tell us that whatever we taught us was not enough. पांच साल से छह साल हम लगाते हैं हाउस जॉब में सॉरी प्राइवेट मेडिसिन में फिर एक साल हाउस जॉब टर्शरी केयर पे लगाते हैं हमें जो सिर्फ सिखाई जाती है चीज वो मेडिसिन है और मेडिसिन जो है वो तकरीबन 20 से 25 परसेंट हल करती है हमारे सेहत के मसाइल को 80 परसेंट 70 से 80 परसेंट मसले कल से हम सुन रहे हैं आज भी आपने सुने हैं कि वो तब तब उसको उसको तब आप मैनेज कर सकते हैं जब आप प्रिवेंशन की तरफ जाएं जो बहुत बड़ा फाउंडर था मेयो क्लिनिक का वो कहता था कि जो सबसे अच्छा फिजिशियन होता है वो बहुत अच्छा ट्रीट करता है लेकिन जो बेस्ट दुनिया का फिजिशियन होगा वो ट्रीटमेंट की नीड ही खत्म कर देगा इफ इफ समवन इज जस्ट ट्रीटिंग विद मेडिसिन Definitely, he's he's contributing a part of uh, uh, the solution. But majority of the people they need uh, prevention, and uh, medicine cannot go unlimited. So the whole concept of this NCDs and the whole concept of this uh, lifestyle medication is is really coming up fast. And you you heard um, in multiple countries there are this new uh, associations of lifestyle modification. If you see, and, and I think you have seen this slide from since yesterday many times uh, the total number of mortality resulting from uh, majority of the cases look at this one uh, stroke ischemic heart disease highest which is the number one killer stroke copd uh, and then comes this uh, cancers and then alzheimer and then ultimately there are two so out of say say six of the top determinants top eight determinants so if we have um, highest eight disorders. Among them, six are related to uh, anything what we eat or 
we drink or we move or we can say like shagufta said physical activity or in actually it is physical inactivity so uh, whatever we are doing on a routine basis on a daily basis the, the the things which we eat since morning till night or late night the things which we are drinking and of course the things which we are doing physically and if you see uh, for the last two years since last year uh, december 2019 and then 2020 and now 21 is half gone covid has i think uh, maybe it has taken this uh, toll to much much higher level even more because it it it, uh, it actually um, limited us for movements uh, going out and doing physical activity so internationally uh, within a year you will see the impact of covid on ncds and all other lifestyle uh, disorders because uh, it in, it inhibited everybody to go into work and physical and everything went online so we were we were talking about that this is something which we we have to understand that in order to uh, prevent the future burden of disease we on one side we can develop new medicine new vaccines and a lot of new technologies but ultimately we have to think of uh, how to prevent the future burden of disease with this uh, a strong strong wind of ncd is coming uh, when i was doing my house job in mayo hospital in 1992 uh, most of the non ncds were associated with uh, like socio economic group so if someone will come and and they will tell us that he or she is uh, a, a from a very low socio economic group and chest pain is there the first thing which we will do is we will insert a cemetidine or a, or a, any other you can say antacid or anything and we will not even think of a heart disease this was a this was a gut feeling that he cannot or she cannot have this is a perception that these diseases are of rich with the passage of time it has trickled down to the poor poor and the most important reason is that this uh, we call it non communicable disease but when i when i was working with dr sanya um, I, i did my phd and she was my supervisor she used to say we although call it non communicable but they are very fastly communicable the bad habits they are communicated from one to other very fastly If, for example this junk food eating this smoking they are all communicable diseases through through in in peers and in groups so although we call it non communicable diseases but there is a very fast communication if someone of very a very dashing personality or a celebrity is doing something everybody tends to uh, do that so uh, and 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 anyone uh, who is coming in a pajero or in a, in a land cruiser and he has a chest pain we will first do uh, ecg in that in that time now if you see the emergency visits i'm working with the fic uh, for quite some time you know, for this uh, research and we have seen that uh, there are so many so many uh, low socio economic group people who are visiting there every day so the number of uh, deaths number of morbidity and a lot of a uh, lot of uh, lot of risk is in the uh, most of these uh, poor groups as well Uh, if we go by lifestyle related disorders i think you heard a lot of national and international things you heard about um, and you will hear it more from imran i think kamran was supposed to be kamran beg sab is is here munawar because he, he he was so yeah so today also it is a talk on tobacco that is a very big problem and myself munawar and many others they advocated and pana was instrumental in getting that taxation for tobacco and now we are working on this sugar and uh, sugar and sweetened beverages to increase taxes it is approved by cabinet it is approved by health minister still the the bureaucracy or what you may call is not ad, uh, doing it in the budget huge number of people uh, they use tobacco in any form it includes cigarette it includes naswar it includes gutka pan chhalia and all the tobacco in any form uh the majority of the people uh, this is a behavioral risk factor surveillance study brfss i'm telling for the students as well it is regularly done in us behavioral risk factor surveillance they do it every year through a telephonic survey and it is very easy they ask a few things about their lifestyle and then they tend to uh, actually see the results and then target those uh, messages to th these people majority of the people in an agricultural country where 70% people are living in the rural areas majority of the people is not having 
salads and fruits every day, which is recommended by now. Uh, I think Shigufta had less time, otherwise she must have uh, told you that plant-based also means vegetable and fruit should be the prime uh, contributor in your diet. Majority of the Pakistanis, they are not having fruit a day, which you call it apple a day, keeps the doctor away. Before Christ level ki uh, proverb hai, uh, it's not just apple. Apple is a symbolic, like uh, the fruit of the season should be taken on every day. Vegetable uh, serving uh, a ball, uh, two ball of uh, vegetable and one fruit every day. Pakistani, you see the number is so less. 90% of the Pakistanis, they are sort of in leisure domain, Farag time mein. In leisure domain, they are, not, they are not doing any physical activity. Only 10% Pakistanis go for a walk or an exercise or a gym. Majority of the other people, and why le leisure domain we mean, if we convince them to do physical activity, they will say we were running all day in the office and I, the lady she says, I was all day working in the household and you say uh, we don't do physical activity. That is not physical activity. Physical activity is defined as the activity done in leisure domain. Only then, if you do a physical activity, then it, it is considered as a physical, as healthy, 90%. And if we ask them, what do you do in, in, in the free time, in leisure domain, half of this 90%, say 45%, they said, we watch TV. It is another risk factor. So you add on uh, one risk factor that uh, that is not doing physical activity and then watching TV and uh, so, 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 or breaking news or drama bhi jis tarah ke aap dekhte hain ye main jaan ke Hasan sahab Urdu mein kahunga gore na sune ke hamare drama kaise hain jaise wo drama hai usme itni stress hoti hai ke uske baad mein logon ko chest pain ho rahi hoti hai ke yaar ye kya hua hai so wo jo drama hai hamare dekhte hain na star plus ko follow kar kar ke kawa chala haas ki chal apni chal bhi bhul gaya ek hamare bachpan ke drama the ke jo social they were they were really on social values and a lot of other things now it is totally opposite so uh, this half of the population who is not doing physical activity is watching TV or on mobile or on like YouTube or anything. The remaining 45% they sleep. So 90% se pucha gaya ke aap karte hai physical activity. So se pucha gaya aur se ne kaha ke we do physical activity. 90 said no. Half of them sleep, which is good. It's good for you, for your health. But other half is so so half of the population is really not doing physical activity and on mobile phone and on TV and on other social media, that is another hazard. Uh, look at this, 90% uh, less than two serving of vegetable. This is, I already told you, leisure domain, 90% is inactive. Look at the, because of these above two, all of the above, you can say. MCQs, if you this is all of the above. Because of the all of the above, we have rising trend of obesity. Waist, hip, circumference, curl, BMR, BMI, everything is going above and it's a very high figure even for the rural population, although it's, it's more in the urban areas. Uh, hypercholesterolemia, if you know the name of Tazeen Jaffer, she does a lot of, lot of uh, metabolic disorder screening set studies. Uh, with heart file, she was uh, uh, she was very active in, in doing these kind of uh, cholesterol level surveys in Pakistan. So we did a lot of surveys. This is not a national level figure, but a huge number of young people. Look at the age group, 15, sorry, 15 to 40. So the, so the most productive age, one in five has hypercholesterolemia. After five, six years, they will end up in RIC or AFIC or any other area with a lot of blood uh, complications like stroke and heart disease. Um, high blood pressure, one in four. So it's very simple and easy to remember. One in four Pakistani adult, one in four Pakistani adult is hypertensive. One in three above the age of 36% or uh, 40, above 40. One in three Pakistanis above the age of 40 is hypertensive. And 90% of them, they don't know that they have this problem. It is usually a sudden or a surprise a finding in various emergency rooms or OPD areas where they come for something else, they get their blood sugar test and then they get their uh, blood pressure tested and they find that it is it is like, look at this new figures, Pakistan Diabetic Association, they have done a huge, huge surveys, national level surveys. It is ranging from 10 per 11 percent to, and I think uh, Basit Saab spoke yesterday or maybe he is speaking today. Uh, we worked with him, Jamal Zafar, Basit Saab, we worked a lot of surveys and uh, it, it is found to be very high. We were thinking of 6%, but the survey result came, it is ranging from 10 to 16%. I think it was highest in KP, which was 13%. 6% um, hepatitis C, 4% hepatitis B, 
diarrhea, anemia in pregnant women, and number of uh, TB cases. And of course, the last was is maternal deaths and neonate deaths. What are these numbers tell us? They tell us that we are living a very, very unhealthy life. And all these diseases are basically the outcomes of what we do. So the, the, when it comes to lifestyle risk factors, Pakistan is having a very, very high values, very, very high numbers as compared to any other developing countries. Um, if you see this, uh, uh, although it is cut on both sides, but these are uh, one of the most common risk factors uh, which are there. And if you see majority of them are related with your lifestyle and majority of these cause non-communicable diseases. This is important. Delhi, we call it disability adjusted life years. So we minus the, uh, the life expectancy may say, we minus the years which the person lived with a disease or a disability. And also death has uh, a loss in a lot of productive years. So if you see the red one, they are the communicable diseases. The red one is communicable and the blue ones are non-communicable and green is injuries. So just focus on three areas and see we are comparing 1990 to 2010 for Pakistan. Uh, please note down there is a global burden of disease study which is done every 10 years, every decade. So global GBT, we call it GBT. Global burden of disease surveys, global burden of disease, a uh, uh, lot of estimations. Pakistan is included in that. I work for them. It is Metrics International in US who, who actually estimate these things. And we are now working on 2020 global burden of disease. So this is uh, the last global burden of disease. It tells us that communicable diseases are going down. So the Delhi is lost. It doesn't say that the number of diseases are going down. The Delhi means the loss of life, mortality, morbidity, and disability. So increasingly, non-communicable non -communicable disease is taking away the toll as compared to communicable disease. So in 1990, it was all malaria, TB, HIV, and all these infections and others, and diarrhea, like you saw, uh, neonatal infections. But now, if you see the blues, all the blues are up. What does it mean? It means since 1990 to 2010, 20 years, the whole paradigm of epidemiology shifted. Now, majority of the disability, mortality, and morbidity is due to non-communicable disease. And these are actual numbers. You can get the actual numbers when you go to Global Burden of Disease Surveys. And the, the red line is communicable. There are a few uh, communicable diseases uh, which are still there, but majority are there. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, request uh, Jalan Saab and uh, Munawar to share these slides, they are all for public. They, they do, do not have any copyright, okay? They are all copy left. So you can all use these slides and, and use it in your training and, and, and dissemination. Uh, I, these are all referenced. I, I have given the references in the footnotes, so you can always use that. So this, this is something which is very troubling for us because you see, uh, although still people are dying because of a communicable disease, but the non-communicable disease are going out of proportion. Um, one thing which is more, I think that is my, uh, would be my last um, uh, sort of a comment. Communicable disease control, irrespective of COVID, has taken a toll out of, and yesterday somebody said that if the COVID has shifted again the burden on infectious diseases and NCD will again be uh, left alone. Uh, but communicable diseases as a whole, most of them have treatments, antibiotics, antivirals, and a lot of vaccinations, especially. Uh, communicable diseases can be prevented, they can be controlled, they can be uh, with sanitation, environmental interventions. And then if, if you have a communicable disease, there is a treatment for TB, malaria, and a lot of other diseases, non-communicable diseases. Once you get it, they stay with you for the rest of your life. So that is a very, very big problem. Communicable disease, a, sh a short antibiotic shot for two weeks, you will be okay. Good treatment will prevent you from dying if, if you get a very good treatment in case of a TB or malaria or anything. In non-communicable diseases, you get a good treatment, but you have to stay alert for the rest of your life. Your whole, your body, lifestyle and medication, they continue to go on. Cancer, heart disease, diabetes, it is a lifelong uh, problem. So the only solution is 
to delay the onset of these diseases. Once you get it, it will be there for you. But if you delay the onset of this chronic diseases and it can be delayed, you heard a lot of speakers yesterday, today as well, the risk factors, all of them, I diet, physical activity, sleep, stress management, and of course, social connection, which was mentioned by, and, and avoiding smoking and substance abuse. So if you see uh, the, this trend, which is ho uh, so horrible to see, that in the in Pakistan, and this is a Pakistan specific data, we are not talking about global thing, still a lot of communicable diseases are here, but still the majority of the delays are being taken up by non communicable disease. So we have to think about whatever uh, we can do to uh, make ourselves uh, going into a healthy lifestyle. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shahzad Ali Khan. Uh, sir, it is always inspiring to uh, hear from you. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Elisha Baska. We have, in fact, uh, recorded talk of Dr. Elisha Baska. And uh, Dr. Elisha Baska is the executive director and co co founder of the Polish Society of Lifestyle Medicine and is an academic teacher uh, at the newly founded first in Poland Department of Lifestyle Medicine based at School of uh, public health at center of postgraduate uh, medical education. He's also a board member and director of communication uh, at European Lifestyle Medicine Council and uh, uh, will have his recorded talk uh, due to the time difference. Uh, please. Good afternoon. Uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, be with you, not in person, uh, but virtually um, at this uh, important conference on non-communicable diseases organized by the Pakistan National Heart Association. It is my great honor and pleasure. Thanks to the organizers for the uh, invitation, as well as congratulations on hosting this event. Um, I will be speaking about the role of lifestyle modification in reversal of non-communicable diseases. Uh, my name is Elcia Vasca. I'm a physician um, and uh, International Board of Lifestyle Medicine Diplomate. Um, on a daily basis, I work as a research assistant at the Department of Lifestyle Medicine School of Public Health at the Center of Postgraduate Medical Education uh, in Warsaw, Poland. I'm also an executive director of the Polish Society of Lifestyle Medicine and a trustee at the European Lifestyle Medicine Council. And I'm very happy that I will be speaking about not only prevention, that is usually being spoken about when referring to lifestyle changes or lifestyle medicine, but about the potential of reversing the diseases. And I will be focusing mostly on the two diseases, but more about that very soon. And first, I would like to remind you what lifestyle medicine is, um, because when speaking about lifestyle changes, it's, um, it, it is becoming more, more popular to refer to a specific branch of, la of medicine that would deal with um, lifestyle interventions. And in the graphic on the right, you can see um, six pillars of lifestyle medicine uh, by American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And when talking about lifestyle changes or lifestyle interventions slash programs, I would be mostly thinking about cha changes being made to the six uh, fields or areas of life uh, that are pointed out here in this slide. Uh, of course, uh, you are all well familiar with uh, the statistics of um, the conditions that you see in the bottom of the slide in Pakistan. I wanted to touch base um, on the situation in Poland to show you that the things that we are, the problems that we are dealing with are very similar. Mm, mm, if we looked at the statistics in the US or Great Britain or other developed countries, we would probably see the very similar percentages of uh, population that is being affected uh, or is suffering from these diseases or conditions. So we can definitely say that non-communicable diseases or lifestyle related diseases, as I prefer to call them, are a global problem. Um, not only for individuals, for our patients, but also from the perspective of healthcare system. So it's important to find and develop new solutions and strategies that would help us um, deal with these uh, diseases, because it seems when we look at the prognosis uh, of the future uh, of, um, of 
health around the world, we can see that uh, we are losing these battles and that we are probably underutilizing some tools that we could make a good use of. And uh, lifestyle interventions are being a good examples of them. Uh, we've known for a long time that healthy lifestyle um, is a perfect prevention and um, following this uh, five rules of lifestyle that are listed here, we could prevent over 90% of diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes cases, over 80% of heart attacks, almost 40% of cancers. We could live uh, longer by 12 to 14 years. And um, we've known that for a long time, we have very strong evidence um, to show that. But still, as uh, you can see, we are not using this knowledge in practice. Uh, and what we've known for not so long, but the evidence is growing and I'm going to be discussing this evidence, that lifestyle could be not only prevention, but could be also pre-reversal um, and uh, hope for our patients. And all of these diseases that you saw in the previous slide, all of these diseases that are listed here are related. And this makes lifestyle intervention so universal because applying the very same um, or very similar approach, uh, we could prevent and treat most of them. And the reason for that is um, inter alia, not, not only, but um, amongst others, the metaflammation or low-grade systemic inflammation that is being said to be underlying most, if not all, modern chronic uh, diseases. And as you can see, um, lifestyle factors can be divided into pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. And this um, lifestyle and habits that were mentioned in this slide with um, high potential of prevention were mostly anti-inflammatory. So for example, weight loss, smoking cessation, um, no or low consumption of alcohol, diet um, full high in fiber and um, in ingredients such as fruits, vegetables, uh, legumes, and are all anti-inflammatory, whereas pro-inflammatory is, for example, lack of activity, um, uh, consumption of alcohol, um, saturated fatty acids or trans fatty acids in our diet. And so it is all related and it makes it uh, potentially easier to be used. Uh, and the two diseases that I'm going to be focusing mostly today are type 2 diabetes and coronary heart disease. And first of all, because uh, the data, the evidence that we have for the potential of using lifestyle in reversal of these diseases is the strongest, the, the best, the, the most well established uh, for the time being. The other reason is that these uh, two conditions um, and when talking about coronary heart disease, of course, thinking also about other cardiovascular diseases, um, they, are, they pose the greatest threats to the health of our patients. And cardiovascular diseases are still the number one killer in developed countries. Type 2 diabetes is the first um, epidemic or even pandemic um, that is a non-infectious or non-communicable disease, um, according to the World Health Organization. And the prognosis are staggering, and uh, I will be speaking about it shortly. Another reason to be talking about type 2 diabetes is that it's just a perfect example of a lifestyle-related diseases. Uh, lifestyle-related diseases usually uh, happen in pairs, and this is another evidence for how related uh, they are. We very rarely see that the patient uh, presents with just one a non-communicable disease, usually it's uh, more. And as you can see, there's almost no isolated type 2 diabetes in, in a study of over 1 million patients. And um, almost 98% of them had at least one comorbid condition in addition to their type 2 diabetes. Uh, almost 90% had at least two. And the most common comorbidities were hypertension, overweight or obesity, hyperlipidemia, chronic kidney disease, and cardiovascular disease. So as you can see, these are all of the diseases that were in this long list and this list could continue. And uh, when speaking about uh, the potential of reversing type 2 diabetes, I will be mostly referring you to the 
a position statement on, on type 2 diabetes remission and lifestyle medicine that was published last year in the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine, as well as to the study that was pu published also uh, in 2020 uh, in the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology, and it was a study called Diademy, an open-label parallel group randomized controlled trial that showed us the effect of intensive lifestyle intervention on body weight and glycemia in early type 2 diabetes. I already mentioned that type 2 diabetes poses a great threat today, but it, see, it seems that the situation is going to get worse in the future. It is predicted that for the children born in the United States after the year 2000, as many as 40% will develop type 2 diabetes. And more and more often we hear and read um, that diabetes reversal should be the goal in the management of type 2 diabetes, not only managing the disease, but aiming at the reversal of the type 2 diabetes um, should be our therapeutic goal and patients should be well aware of the fact that possibly the condition is reversible, uh, and which is uh, opposite to what we used to historically um, discuss or think when dealing with type 2 diabetes. And of course, we've known for a long time that lifestyle medicine intervention of type 2 diabetes can be more effective um, than, for example, the standard care, uh, which is metformin. And we have right now more and more evidence showing us that, again, lifestyle medicine or lifestyle interventions could be more effective in reversing type 2 diabetes than uh, pharmacotherapy and as effective as, for example, bariatric surgery, but with lower side effects. And um, I mentioned that I will be referring mostly to the position statement of the ACLM, but it's uh, worth pointing out that um, uh, in 2019, the Association of British Clinical Diabetologists and the Primary Care Diabetes Society published their position statement, and they also mentioned diabetes remission, um, with a lifestyle approach or bariatric surgery, this lifestyle approach was short-term dramatic caloric reduction with total dietary replacement, which is a part of the diademic trial that I'm going to discuss. In the table on the right, you see also the American guidelines on lifestyle therapy in type 2 diabetes. So you can see that um, a lifestyle management of, or lifestyle treatment is widely uh, widely present in uh, the guidelines, but we still have problems with their implementation. Uh, when referring to remission, I will be um, referring, I will be basing um, this uh, definition of remission um, on this, um, this definition by views. Um, I won't be digging into the details right now, but they are available in the position statement of the ACLM that I mentioned or in this article. So you can um, have a look there to see how the remission partial or complete war was defined there. Uh, what is very important to mention is that uh, when referring to the potential of diabetes reversal, we need to remember that the lifestyle intervention, lifestyle ch change, need to be sufficiently intensive. And this is one of the greatest obstacles in order to have this lifestyle approach effective or to see the results that we would like to see. Very often, um, patients are only encouraged to make small small changes. They are not assisted when doing these changes, and these changes are difficult to be sustained, uh, while optimal treatment with this big caloric reduction will be probably um, a whole food plant-based dietary pattern coupled with moderate exercise. And of course, uh, we will possibly need here uh, in um, directing and implementing this whole intensive lifestyle change program, a uh, whole interdisciplinary team that will take care of our patient. The most important studies that focus on the potential of type 2 diabetes reversal are the studies uh, that are listed here in this slide. I hope that you will um, find time to um, review them. Uh, we don't have time to dig into the details of them today, but I want to focus a little bit on the direct study and diademic trial um, to show you how big the potential of type 2 diabetes reversal is uh, with uh, the intensive lifestyle change. As you can see, 
um, intensive laser intervention led to significant weight loss at 12 months and was associated with diabetes remission in over 60% of participants um, and over 30% of participants achieved normal glycemia. And these are the impressive diademy trial um, results. Direct study showed us also very similar um, potential. One year remission was achieved in almost 50% um, of uh, the patients in the intervention group versus only 4% of patients in the control group, which was the standard care group. It showed us how um, big potential and or how much more effective this new approach towards diabetes treatment uh, could be. And uh, it's uh, similar to what I referred you to when talking about the potential of lifestyle change in prevention type 2 diabetes and how much we are still underutilizing that. Uh, the key takeaways when going through all of the studies are that the caloric restriction is the basis of the intensive lifestyle change. And this um, caloric restriction was referred as dramatic. And I will show you uh, why uh, shortly. And probably also what is important to remember that physical activity is important, of course, and should be a part of the lifestyle change. But diet um, seems to have a major role compared to physical activity. Uh, the dramatic um, diet replacement therapy um, or intensive therapeutic lifestyle change meant in direct trial and diademic trial that patients received only 800, calo 800 calories per day um, for three to five months. Then it was uh, they were gradually introduced to um, to to the diet afterwards. And both of these trials were quite complex. They required interdisciplinary support. And um, we should remember about that when talking or when thinking even about this lifestyle approach, it will show us also um, already that this um, intense therapeutic lifestyle change programs have pretty many limitations if we compare them to our possibilities in our healthcare systems nowadays. Um, uh, we do not have time to discuss the results in details, uh, but uh, I already mentioned how great the reversal potential was. And another thing that I want to point out when thinking about lifestyle medicine is that the very often, the, the slogan that you will meet very often is that lifestyle medicine or lifestyle interventions are treating the cause. And it's very much accurate when we think about um, how or why our patient um got to us what changes or what dietary patterns, what habits related to their lifestyle brought them to our office and um, were the direct cause of their condition. But it's also remember, it's also worth remembering that that by treating the cause, we have this greater potential of um, addressing not only the symptoms as most of the pharmacotherapy does, but actually um, looking at the very match the underlying background of the condition. And it's not only true for type 2 diabetes, but it's also true, for example, for coronary heart disease. And what is uh, important to remember is also that we should treat lifestyle modification the way we treat pharmacotherapy. Uh, we dose pharmacotherapy um, and we should dose um, lifestyle changes, those in case of prime therapeutic importance in a pharmaceutical context, with lifestyle medicine, it is no different. And this is uh, something that um, should be remembered when we try to encourage, encourage our patients to undertake some lifestyle modifications. We should treat them as they were as important or more important that the pharmacotherapy that we are prescribing. And as I mentioned already, one of the greatest obstacles of why we don't see this impressive results that we see in the, in the studies and articles in our patients uh, is that the therapeutic dose of lifestyle change was not achieved. 
Of course, we have many limitations, as I mentioned already. Uh, we still have very little studies in comparison to, for example, pharmacotherapy studies, and we still have um, obstacles from the healthcare system. I mentioned that we need a whole interdisciplinary team, um, that we need to have the possibilities to reimburse this kind of approach, not only pharmacotherapy treatment, pharmacological treatment, but also lifestyle treatment. But we also have a big problem when it comes to medical education. And I hope that we will soon see big changes in this field. Uh, healthcare professionals, physicians included, are still not treated uh, sufficiently when it comes to using this potential of prevention and treatment uh, with lifetime medicine. A couple of words about coronary heart disease here. Mm, uh, the, a person uh, that you are maybe familiar with, the person that mm, most often is associated with uh, the term reversal of coronary heart disease is Dr. Dean Ornish and his work. Um, he showed us that a low-fat vegetarian diet mm, coupled with other lifestyle interventions um, is more effective than the American Heart Association um, diet and other standard lifestyle interventions. And he also showed us that even the standard care that was in, in intervention care of the patient um, is less effective than the lifestyle change programs. Um, as you can see, uh, comprehensive lifestyle changes in ambulatory patients with moderate to severe uh, coronary heart disease resulted in significant reductions in both LDL cholesterol and ang anginal episodes after one year's, year and showed even more regression of coronary atherosclerosis after five years than the standard care um, that, we, that was compared in the study. Um, to sum up, there is no modern medicine without lifestyle medicine. And um, we only spoke today in details about two diseases, but if we chose other diseases from this long list, probably um, the results or the key takeaways would be very similar or will be very similar in the future. As I mentioned, the, the life medicine field is growing in more evidence and we will be soon having more to discuss, I hope. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me here. And uh, I wish you a great conference and thank you once again for the invitation. Uh, our next speaker for uh, uh, this session and probably the last speaker for the session is uh, Dr. Tahira Sadik. She is Associate uh, Professor Community Medicine at uh, uh, Islamic International Medical College and uh, Associate Director at uh, Rifa Institute of Lifestyle Medicine. And she'll be speaking on the matrix of a healthy lifestyle. Uh, over to Dr. Tahira. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim and assalamu alaikum everyone. Can you hear me and see my slides as well? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm Dr. Tahira Sadi. Currently, I'm working as Associate Professor of Public Health at IMC and uh, as Assistant Director of the Institute of Lifestyle Medicine. It is widely acknowledged that the fact that almost all non-communicable diseases are linked to an unhealthy lifestyle, yet no one knows exactly what the perfect lifestyle is. Here comes the importance of the metrics of a healthy lifestyle, which is today's topic. So when we talk about the metrics of healthy lifestyle, its relation with the non-communicable diseases, it starts considering individuals as a holistic being. The goal is a wellness that encompasses the entire person rather than just the lack of physical pain or disease. More comprehensive view of wellness outlines the six different dimensions of well-being, including emotional, physical, social, occupational, and even spiritual. The holistic process offers individuals the opportunity to, to, create, to be creator of their own reality of health through an understanding of all levels of health and a balanced lifestyle. We often talk about non-communicable diseases and their relation with the lifestyle modalities as a web of causation, which are not just interrelated, but they are linked to many individual diseases and lead ends up into multiple chronic diseases. So the risk factors are common to many conditions, most of them starting from 
illiteracy, poverty, globalization, urbanization labeled as social determinants, leading to behavioral risk factors of unhealthy living followed by metabolic risk factors in terms of raised blood pressure, abnormal glucose and lipid level, and ultimately ending up in chronic diseases. We call lifestyle diseases as non-communicable, but just as the first speaker said, in terms of behavior, cultural values, and environmental factors, they do spread among family members and community from one and other, so we can say that they are all contagious. The use of evidence-based lifestyle therapeutic approaches such as predominantly whole food plant-based diet, regular physical activity, adequate sleep, 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 stress management, avoidance of risky substances, use and non-drug modalities to treat oftentimes reverse and prevent the lifestyle-related chronic non-communicable diseases. That's all too prevalent in our country. Keeping in mind individual differences and complexities of each behavior, concept of one size fits all needs to be fixed in order to reduce the burden of non-communicable diseases. For that matter, we need to see all the components one by one. So what are the healthy habits? Just like just a few time before, Dr. Shigufta Feroz highlighted that food plays an integral role in our lives, not only physically, but socially, emotionally, and even spiritually. All eating the right foods in the right amount at the appropriate uh, time and avoiding the wrong ones is absolutely essential. As you can see that Eat the rainbow, avoid or limit animal products, limit oils, sugars, alcohol intake, fill up on fiber-rich plant food, stay hydrated, examine emotional factors, keep proportions in check, mindful eating, that is again a very important pillar of uh, correct eating. Eat until satisfied versus eating until full. Create a healthy food environment, balance meals throughout the day in spite of taking once a day meal you need to balance the meal throughout the day and cook at home in order to avoid from junk food. So the next important component is exercise. And we consider exercise as a medicine. Why? Because a little exercise does go a long way. Even small steps can collectively have a major impact on person's health. Regular exercise has been shown to have a positive effect on both length and quality of a person's life. And it affects all your 11 systems of body, not just lowering the lipids and avoiding from heart attacks. It do increase your uh, digestion. It increases your muscle strength and even your reproductive health issues. So the need is, in spite of advising patients about exercises, there is a great need to prescribe exercise in terms of frequency, intensity, time, type, volume, and you need to keep a check on their progression as well. The third important modality of healthy lifestyle matrix is sleep, which is considered foundational for health. Getting a good night's sleep is one of the most important things people can do for their overall health and well-being. The problem is that although all people need to sleep, how they experience sleep can be quite varied. In addition, there has been an increase in sleep loss, which is driven largely by broad societal changes, including greater resilience, no longer work and longer work hours, shift work and increase access to television and internet. In workplace, uh, sleep deprivation results in many, many injuries. So being a healthcare coach, what you need to do is you need to identify the barriers to sleep, and you need to see that its relation to physiological, psychological, behavioral environment, and even few medications, they do affect sleep. And based on these uh, modalities, you can actually recommend the sleep or prescribe the sleep to your patient. So sleep is not passive. It requires a proactive routine, including regular sleep wake routine, regular physical activity, daily exposure to outdoor light, control caffeine and nicotine intake, and limit the consumption of alcohol. Power down before bedtime to block melatonin. Craft your surrounding environment to support optimal sleep. 
get the sleep you need when you need it as efficiently as possible if you may keep it only 20 to 30 minutes a day coming to the next modality that is stress and stress and resilience it is constant in people's daily lives stress does not discriminate and the one example of this discrimination is that many studies have done on our physicians facing burnout and stress it affects everyone from time to time, men, women, rich, poor, at home or workplace, thin or skinny or obese. It does not matter. No person is immune from stress. Sharing the concept of flow with patients will help them to better understand how to handle situations when they are in anxiety zone of the chart. If an individual has a low level of skill and is facing a relatively large challenge, they will experience anxiety rather than flow. If they have a high level of skill and are confronted with a relatively small challenge, they will experience boredom rather than flow. So you need to create a balance. As you can see, stress affects your health badly and there here comes a role of metaphysical heart. Chronic stress such as workplace stress is a contributor to cardiovascular diseases because it raises norepinephrine levels which increases heart rate and ultimately hypertension and heart attack. Elevated levels of stress hormones such as cortisol and norepinephrine suppresses immunity by altering the actions of cytokines, cell signaling molecules that are produced by immune cells. So the important, there are many external and internal factors that need to be identified and to minimize their effect no, but no on body, mood and behavior is build resistance to stress, keeping these techniques in mind. Number one, adopt an attitude of gratitude. Be thankful. Number two, be altruistic rather than self-centered. Number three, retain a capacity for wonder and delight in life. Number four, find a purpose of life. Number five, keep a healthy sense of modesty about accomplishments and goals. Beside the traditional addictions, we need to focus on modern day addictions, consuming junk food, gaming, increased screen time, which required continuous sitting. And as we know that sitting is considered next to smoking nowadays and a major risk factor for non-communicable diseases. So beside all those addictions because of smoking and tobacco use and alcoholics, we also need to give attention to these type of addictions as well. Last component of healthy lifestyle matrix is power of connection. According to Maslow's hierarchy, we need people, people need people to provide emotional support and beneficial relationships. According to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, a sense of belonging is one of our most important human needs after physiological needs. People to have continued motivation, they need three sense of connection. And among that, most important is social support. That social support could be in terms of physician, nurse, nutrition, expert, professional fitness, who are continuously guiding them how and what to adopt in terms of adopting a healthy lifestyle. Or it could be in terms of your connection that keeps you really alive and thriving in terms of your family, origin, immediate family, friends, work, placement, beauty, good memories, nature, special places, pets, and even animals, ideas, information, institutions, whatever is beyond knowledge. And the most important, you yourself is the best person to talk with. So for that matter, first of all, you need to identify the barriers which are leading for, which are hindering you from having effective relationships, including technology, lack of confidence, communication, poor communication skills, fear of change, and everything which, surround, which is surrounding the person can be the risk factor for having bad social connections. So multiple risk factors are involved in lifestyle diseases, and they are all interrelated. That is the reason we are calling them as metrics of healthy lifestyle change because there is a contribution which is required from all the domains. 
starting from the multiple risk factors they are involved in lifestyle disease interventions need attention of multiple disciplines multiple dis- departments including policy makers from media health and food departments and all multi- multisectoral coordination is in need need to apply at multiple levels in terms of age group gender culture social class professionals and starting from individual level to family community and ultimately at national and global level is we are calling it as a matrix because it involves multiple physician competencies to address lifestyle related diseases as you can see a lifestyle coach should be having leadership skills should have knowledge assessment management and community support for efficient lifestyle behavior change modalities multiple preventive strategies at the level of primordial primary secondary and tertiary level is needed in order to get the best result most importantly there is a great need of changing the behavior of individual and society through applying different behavioral therapies in terms of lifestyle prescription in order to have a real time data there is a great need to explore where we are standing in terms of research in order to bridge the gap between what is the current status of lifestyle practices in pakistan and where and how we can achieve that thank you very much that was all from my side be positive about your changing your lifestyle because a positive attitude takes focused effort we all realize that this is the high time to train ourselves as medical experts and coach to prescribe lifestyle modifications along with drugs here i would like to profoundly mention that rifa international university under kind leadership of chancellor rifa international university mr hasan mohammed khan and dynamic leadership of dr shugufta feroz and professor dr general azhar rakib and institute of rifa institute of lifestyle medicine has been established and providing this opportunity to train healthcare professionals in lifestyle interventions through offering different courses and mostly focusing on self care first and then guiding your family students and patients about lifestyle medicine thank you very much thank you so much uh, dr tahira sadik uh, i think the good thing is that all the speakers were quite on time and uh, we have a few minutes to take one to two questions from the audience uh, if anyone want to have Uh, to ask any question from the speakers we have online speakers as well and dr shahzad ali khan there anyone yes please mic sir as you said that we are living unhealthy lifestyle don't perform physical activity or we don't eat a uh, healthy foods but in the covid pandemic the number of deaths are more in other countries than pakistan what is the reason behind this i guess dr shahzad peace actually you uh, answered your question um, in your own question agar aapne kaha na ke hum bade bure halat mein rehte hain to when the people they are not prone to so many uh, viruses and bacteria as they are not uh, living in a unhygienic conditions and eating unhealthy food uh most of them they already develop resistance and you you all are medical students you know what immunity is so they they develop a lot of resistance to these so hardship mein rehne ka ek advantage hota hai jo shayad sirf covid mein hoga iske alawa nahi hoga uh one thing is that we uh, have so many already prevalent infections in all form bacteria and viruses number one number two uh which is and, and i think I, i this question was asked many times because i was working uh, with the covid i am a member of ncoc as well um the number two is um, we are very young we are actually the youngest uh, population in the world uh, 65% of pakistanis are less than 25 year of age and you know uh, covid was more prone to uh, to, to have um, it, it had a sort of predisposition towards elderly so the deaths uh, although the infections would have been much much higher not everybody went for testing uh, testing was limited it was expensive so the number of cases always were coming out of the test so if you don't test you don't get numbers there are countries in africa where there was no case because there was no testing done 
so they they thought ke ji hamara to yahan pe aaya hi nahi they they definitely would have been deaths and other thing so number one is we are very young number two is we are already uh, so much in a very hardship conditions very very poor uh, unhygienic areas and then number three was we uh, were lucky to have uh, it quite delayed you know china got it in uh, november december and then january february we got our first case in by the end of february so already internationally it was known uh, it had hit italy america spain and all the developed countries first and when it came to pakistan and and they were slow progression initially you know it was the tablighi jamaat and the iran zairines and then started coming from the uk so we had an uh, like a Uh, peak in last year june so we already knew what should be done what can be done and we enforced a smart lockdown or whatever you may call the response was good and remember pakistanis are the number one medical providers in the world so ye zarur yaad rakhna ki hamare jo medical medical doctors hain medicine mein clinic clinical medicine mein they are one of the best so in inhone kuch apne bhi you know experiments kiye dexamethasone ki study it was proven after 6 months but i i know many people in pakistan who already started uh, giving steroids to to the people and they had they said we are having 100% results so there are multiple multiple things but it doesn't mean that we have a very good health system we have a very poor uh, health system there are so many issues with us uh, we are trying to improve that but this one condition was uh, we were lucky actually we were lucky aur allah ke naam pe bana hai humne to kaha tha pakistan mein isliye hua hai ki ye ramzan mein bana hai allah ke naam allah hi bacha raha hai hamara to koi hal nahi hai uh just one comment here You see, yesterday this was mentioned by one of our keynote speakers in the first session that communicable diseases play havoc in the mind field of non-communicable diseases. They ignite the non-communicable. That is what has happened at COVID-19, and the world, which thought that they are rid of the communicable diseases, they had the mind field of non-communicable diseases, where a communicable disease played the havoc. That's what happened. thank thank uh, i think kal ek badi interesting baat hui hai aap sare students hain it's very good if you allow me just one minute um, pandemic aap usko kehte ho jo 6 7 mulkon se zyada mulkon mein phai yahi yahi hamari hai na ki pandemic jab bahut sare mulkon mein phail jata hai kal kisi ka sawal tha ek international expert hai uh, he said uh, you call covid pandemic but tb malaria hiv hepatitis it is it is present in almost all the countries of the world and you don't call that pandemic anymore so usne ek bada zabardast ek wo nukta uthaya he said ki ye pandemic ka matlab ye hota hai ki agar ameer mulk koi kisi bimari mein mubtala ho jaye na to wo to pandemic hai aur jab wo ameer mulk usse jaan chhuda le aur wo gareebon ka masla reh jaye to phir wo pandemic nahi rehta phir usko kehte hain endemic and epidemic so i was uh, mai bada astonished hua wo pad ke sara i'll share it with with the group ki usne kaha ki ye pandemics hain sari ye sari duniya mein hai lekin kyunki angrez ka masla nahi hai tb aur malaria aur typhoid aur cholera to isliye wo pandemic nahi kehta jis din aur usne point kya tha jis din covid se unhone jaan chhuda li developed countries ne ye hamare yahan pe epidemic aur endemic ho jayega pakistan se gaya to nahi hai na abhi humne to early celebration shuru kar di thi wo dobara aa gaya fir dobara abhi humne release kiya fir chauthi wave aa rahi hai so that is also to be discussed among ourselves the senior leadership ke ye angrez ab apna vaccination kar lega aur jab wo apne paas se isko kar lega to it will be like a epid epid endemic in pakistan or epidemic in every week, every year it will come and kill millions uh so with your permission permission to share one comment is essential because this comment probably is required to be made on record because this is a recommendation which pana along with rifa is going to be making to the ministry of health to be cited in the closing ceremony by the by the representative of minister of ministry of health we have recommended from the pana's platform as one of the recommendations of this conference that there should be preventive health and wellness clinic the lifestyle medicine clinics the nutrition and dietary clinics in every large healthcare institution or hospital of the country because this explanation needs to be recorded because if we need to manage the health of the nation the primordial prevention begins and continues till the end of the management 
whether successful in the form of cure of a patient or loss of a life. So this wellness prevention must be incorporated in the clinical practice. And the last comment that I want, this is not to be recorded in our recommendation, but this is only for this. Sir, my recommendation to you is, as long as our all wellness clinic experts and the lifestyle medicine people will remain academic, they will not have any use. You need to come out of the cocoon of your universities and colleges and schools and come into the field of healthcare delivery. There is your role. Your role is not only in teaching. You need to come out. You need to come out of this hibernation and be part of the clinical practice that we all do every day, day in and day out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Shahzad and Dr. Wajid uh, for your uh, a response to the question. One thing just I want to add with the permission of Dr. Shahzad Ali. Uh, of course, I think the technical reasons are definitely uh, well explained by you. One thing that I really want to make a comment that two of our borders were having a disaster like Iran and India. And let's recognize that uh, we have done well uh, in spite of all those challenges and the health system that could not match uh, uh, the other good countries, but still uh, we, the, the evidence shows that we have been able to do well. So let's always recognize the good things that are happening in the country. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, now I would request uh, uh, the chair uh, and co-chair of the session, uh, Dr. Hassan Mahmood Khan and Brigadier Retired Maksudul Hassan to please uh, present uh, a souvenir to our speakers. And we have Dr. Shahzad Ali Khan uh, there. Uh, sir, please, if you can. I request the President to uh, shield for the maneuver, sir. Uh, thank you so much. And now I would uh, request uh, Chairman of the session, uh, Dr. Hassan Mahmood Khan, uh, for his concluding remarks for the session. Sir, please. Auzubillah, Minish Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, Honorable President, uh, Pakistan National Heart Association, General Basudur Rahman Kiani Saab, um, esteemed guests, uh, of course, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Health Services Academy. I see very dynamic practitioners here, Dr. Wajid, uh, Dr. Abdul Gayoom Khan, mashallah, is an institution uh, by in himself in Pakistan, has worked so hard for the cause of Pana. Uh, Honorable uh, Dean Faculty of Medicine, General Zahra Rashid Sahab. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, Assalamu Alaikum. Uh, it was an honor and pleasure to be at this session. Uh, and I think uh, the stats that were presented to us by the esteemed speakers were mind boggling. Um, and they were, I think, astounding. The impact of lifestyle choices on healthcare uh, is, is for all of us uh, to see. Uh, Refine International University had established Refine Institute of Lifestyle Medicine about two years back uh, under the leadership of Dr. Shukufta Feroz. And one of the key reasons why the university is investing into lifestyle medicine uh, is the fact that we believe that NCTs cannot be tackled by developing primary care, tertiary care, and secondary care uh, health units. Uh, we must actually work very deeply into health promotion. Uh, incidentally, just to respond to you, Dr. Wajid's suggestion, we had actually established a lifestyle medicine clinic in one of our hospitals, Max Health Hospital, uh, and Dr. Shugufta was uh, practicing there. But unfortunately, because of COVID, uh, it was 
you know, delayed a little bit. So it was open with, you know, great acceptability by the patients. Uh, right, uh, Refine Institute of Lifestyle Medicine also conducted uh, a th three month certificate course on lifestyle medicine, whereby, and I'm so encouraged by that, inspired by our faculty, that our senior, senior professors and consultants from faculty of medicine have uh, done this course. So actually the idea is to bring it into the practice, bring it to the you know, floor of the hospitals and your outpatients and actually healthcare delivery system, that's very important. Uh, another aspect is uh, you know, one of the reasons why we went into uh, lifestyle medicine, and I believe it's going to be the cutting edge medical practice for tomorrow. Uh, and for all the young uh, doctors and medical students that I see here today, I strongly encourage you to explore this as a speciality uh, for you. It's cutting edge. If you look at uh, Britain, uh, so any of the societies, the British Cardiology Society, General Azhar would probably know, and you see that the society was established maybe 100 years ago, uh, you know, uh, 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 the cricket academy uh, the you know, in britain 150 years ago so everything which is associated probably with uk it so you know has a very deep uh, history but lifestyle medicine the society of british lifestyle medicine was established in 2016 only the american lifestyle medicine again i don't know the exact figure probably last seven to seven to eight years so even in advanced countries, the practice of lifestyle medicine is at the cutting edge. It's just uh, starting to create an impact and acceptability. Uh, we've already seen the figures. I think Dr. Alicia's talk, she talked about that uh, because of lifestyle changes. 48% uh, of the patients had remission in type 2 diabetics uh, within the first year. Dunia ki koi goli jo hai, Diabetics, see, I'm not a medical doctor. Incidentally, people do call, keep on calling me a doctor. I'm not a doctor. So, there is no goalie, you know, just say aapki hypertension theek ho jati hai. <clears throat> All the treatment that we have right now, and at least in allopathic medicine, uh, for chron chronic diseases, they are not treatments. They are just uh, interventions so that the disease remains under control. They do not take care of the uh, disease. They do not cure the patients. Uh, I hope I'm, what I'm saying is factually correct. So the only way to take care of the disease burden, to the only way to actually cure diseases, NCDs, uh, uh, I think, I, I believe, is uh, lifestyle med medicine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you would be happy to notice that, inshallah, we are focusing on developing a curriculum which would be integrated at MBBS level. It will be integrated our all our health professionals' curriculums, curricula in uh, Rafa University, in our re rehabilitation sciences, in dental sciences, in medical sciences, in pharmaceutical sciences, and also, uh, you know, uh, our, in our nursing uh, curriculum as well. Uh, because one, one of the things, and I, I say this with very uh, due respect to all the doctors, I'm son, son of a noted doctor, I come from a you know, family of doctors and I've spent most of my time um, in, in healthcare community, so I you know, owe them uh, so much respect. But you know, look at the facts. MBBS curriculum, mein, teachers better way, principals, deans, vice chancellors are better way. मुझे बताएं कि आप हेल्थ प्रमोशन के ऊपर, लाइफस्टाइल के ऊपर, न्यूट्रिशन के ऊपर कितने घंटे का कोर्स अवेलेबल है, कौन सा कोर्स अवेलेबल है? फिर से आप तो कम्युनिटी मेडिसिन मार्शल और प्रोफेसर, हार्डली एनी। देन आफ्टर यू डू योर एमबीबीएस, यू गो इनटू हाउस जॉब, हमारे हॉस्पिटल्स में वन examinable, accessible content in uh, uh, healthcare promotion paper. Not a minute is taught. Koi teacher apne khud interest se, koi, you know, faculty member padha dein to padha dein. Then what happens? Then you do your FCP, FCPS part one. Mera bade, you've got part one and FCPS, mashallah, deans and supervisors sitting here. 
एफ सी पी एस पार्ट वन के पेपर में मुझे बताइए कि पिछले दस साल में कितने सवाल जो हैं वो आपके लाइफ स्टाइल मेडिसिन और एक्चुअली हेल्थ एंड न्यूट्रिशन पे आए हों स्टूडेंट्स वो तैयार करते हैं जिसका इम्तिहान देना होता है उसके बाद आप क्या करते हैं आफ्टर यू डू योर एफ सी पी एस पार्ट वन यू गो इन टू योर फेलोशिप ट्रेनिंग फोर ईयर्स मेडिकल डॉक्टर आपने मेडिसिन uh, में जाना है आपने कार्डियोलॉजी में जाना है जिस मर्जी में ऑर्थोपीडिक्स में जाना है जनरल सर्जरी में जाना है आपके फोर ईयर्स फाइव ईयर्स की जो ट्रेनिंग होती है उसमें भी डॉक्टर्स को सर्जन को कुछ भी नहीं पढ़ाया जाता हेल्थ केयर और हेल्थ प्रमोशन के ऊपर उसके बाद क्या होता है आप एफसीपी एफसीपीएस पार्ट टू देते हैं अपने डोमेन सब्जेक्ट में उसमें मुझे बताइए क्या सवाल या कंटेंट आता है जब ट्रेनिंग में नहीं शामिल हुआ तो ऑब्वियसली वो एग्जामिनेशन में नहीं होता सो एट द एंड दिस इज द सेम सीनियो ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड दिस इज नॉट यूनिक टू पाकिस्तान आई एक्चुअली शेयर इट विद द जनरल सेक्रेटरी ऑफ एमी association of medical education in europe which is the largest and the oldest medical education association in the world every year they have a conference in one of the european cities with like 3 4000 uh, people coming in from you know the deans from harvard to russia to china from everywhere and i've been going there for the last 20 years and i'm on some of their boards as well so professor ron harden who's the first uh, nobel prize uh, winner in medical education so a couple of years ago i talked to him i said professor ron i i have been coming to amy conference why do you not talk about lifestyle medicine so so on our suggestion alhamdulillah so last year so in the first time in the history of amy in europe they had a complete session symposium actually on lifestyle medicine so we we you know, and amy sets up the medical educational agenda of the world it's a very powerful very impactful organization so you will see this start, starting to happen uh, in the rest of the world as well so i'm so glad that uh, uh, jan sahab uh, jan kyani sahab uh, pakistan national heart association uh, i think has been uh, before we had even come up with the terminologies of lifestyle medicine uh, you've been working for it for the last uh, i think 30 years 40 years i remember as a kid uh, when i was in 10th grade or 11th grade uh, pana used to organize lovely walks followed by you know healthy lunches in mari and i had the honor to be associated with uh, pana from for the last i think 35 40 years uh, uh, and i think you've done just a marvelous job rafa is there to support any activity of pakistan national heart association uh, once again a very impressive session i am thankful and inspired by the talks of all the speakers here thank you very much shamil